Desmond Brown. Okay, so my name's Miranda. Um, I'm a barrister from East London, but I've also been involved in lots of community and justice campaigns and activism for many years. So I'm a member of something called African, Caribbean and Asian Lawyers for Justice um, and Barak UK, um, Black Activists Rising Against Cuts. We've been campaigning against deportations, um, helping uh, Windrush victims get compensation. So I also sit on a clinic um, helping, a legal clinic helping Windrush victims. So I've got my fingers in lots of pies, but the day job um, is as a barrister. Um, so tonight was the second time I had watched this because I watched it um, last week. Uh, and it's really sunk in. It's kind of like, um, you know, when you kind of soak the fruit in the rum and it looks amazing, marinated. you know, marinated, yeah. Um, but from a legal perspective, because I think you wanted me to kind of think with um, my legal hat on, there, there are two messages that, that emanate from this play for me. The first is to think about the law as it is and the law as we want it to be. And you could clearly see that in the play there was that tension um, between those who said, well, this is the law, you just accept the law, and those who were pushing and saying, well, no, no, this isn't right. And in the end, in the appeal, it was the second argument that prevailed. Now, we have a duty, I think, now, in this modern era, of applying what we learned from that play, to, to apply that the world, the law as we would wish it to be. And you, you did it here, in Bristol, the jury, um, that um, refused to convict the Colston Four. That's what they did because the law was it was criminal damage. But that jury said no, no, no. Hearing everything, having David Olukstonga come and talk about the horrors and the detail of what happened during slavery, just as we heard in that play, it was the law as we wish it to be. And I think that hopefully is where we're moving as a country. Just yesterday, the Law Society, very, very establishment organisation, published a report. Um, that said we need to look at the legal frameworks um, for nature, for rivers, for animals. I don't know if you saw it, it was in The Guardian yesterday. They want to give legal rights to animals, uh, trees, rivers. Okay, now people will think that's totally bonkers. Why would we give legal rights to animals, rivers and trees? But then you could have said the same when they decided to give women the vote or to say they were not the property of their husbands or to decriminalise homosexuality. That was the world as we and the law as we wished it to be. So we have to keep pushing, and we still have uh, trial by jury in this country. Try and protect that. If any of you are jurors or have been jurors, when you come to have to judge a, a, a case, take from tonight's play, it's about the law as you wish it to be. Don't be hamstrung by what the judge says. That's the first point. The second, shorter point I wanted to make, um, as I said, I'm a barrister but I didn't study law, I did the graduate diploma in law, so I converted from being a humanities and politics student to do law. Um, and contract law, those of you who studied law, is all about shipping, okay? It's all cases from 17, whatever, all about shipping, contract, and how you make contracts. I had no idea when I did this course in 2009, 2010, that's 10, 12 years ago, that the shipping cases they were talking about were about slavery. I had no idea, none. And um, we just, we went into this blind, um, and I almost think that there needs to be a change. We've got to put pressures on our uni pressure on our universities, especially for subjects such as law, uh, business, history, that they need to give us an accurate <coughs> history of what went on. But, you know, we were just talking about moving goods, and these were people. Um, so though, as with my barrister hat on, those are the two main things I took away um, from the play and how it affects us and what we can do as activists and um, campaigners moving forward. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Um, I think one of the reasons why Sado and Rob asked me to do this is because um, my charity, along with English Heritage, actually did an event uh, at Kenwood House uh, the house where uh, the Chief Justice, Lord Mansfield, used to live. Uh, we were looking at this year uh, on June the 22nd, uh, not some equinox, but actually uh, the anniversary, 250th years of the Mansfield judgment. 
uh, which predates um, this case. But this case um, is really, really important. And Rob knows also, like him, I'm a film buff. And of course, even Spielberg was so intrigued by this story that he made a film based on it. Um, so I think the legal aspect of it is really, really important because when we were doing some of the research around this anniversary, around the Somerset case, the Somerset case is basically uh, about um, somebody comes over on a ship uh, and comes into London, a slave, and makes a dash for it. The owner of the ship and the owner of the slave recaptures the slave and then decides to sell him off to one of the plantations in uh, America or Jamaica. What Mansfield does is he makes a judgment on the case because the slave is released and held uh, and abolitionists support him. But what Mansfield does, and this is something that actually blew my mind that I didn't know, which is that slavery was never made legal in the UK. But at the same time, it was never illegal. So what you get in the 18th century is a whole series of cases brought by the ship owners and brought by the abolitionists trying to determine whether slavery should be illegal or not. And so there's toing and froing. And the Zong case falls within that framework. So that quote, um, let justice be done of the heavens fall, actually comes from the Somerset case. Because what he's basically saying is, this guy is going to be made free. If that consequently means that people take it, that slavery is not legal, or the recapture of slaves is not legal, then so be it. Um, of course, and this is the interesting thing, real life doesn't work like that. What happens is, English law is based on legal precedent. It's not based on a constitution. So what do people do? They ignore the precedent, first of all. And secondly, they find different ways around it. So slaves brought on ships are then <coughs> deemed by certain clever people as apprentices, not slaves. And that way, people are able to get around the law or indeed ignore it. And so going up through 1807, the first um, so-called uh, abolition of the transatlantic slave, and let's get that clear, that's the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. It's not the abolition of slavery. That doesn't come till later, 1834. And even then, in the reading that I did, the amount of trade in slavery actually goes up. It doesn't go down. It's just that it's concentrated in South America and other parts of the world. Uh, so one of the things that we also have to get our heads around, both in terms of the United States, the Caribbean, <coughs> and England, is that the slave trade in those three spheres is minuscule compared to what actually happened in South America. In fact, the number of slaves taken to Brazil outnumbers all the slaves in the UK, all the slaves in the Caribbean, and in North America by about three to one. So our knowledge of slavery actually isn't that great. It's quite shallow. Uh, and despite all the films, despite all the stuff going on in schools, it's really, really important that we get an understanding of the importance of the slave trade in South America, because that's where the action really is. And even the stuff that's taught in the universities and the schools is poor in terms of what it uh, explains in terms of that narrative. So there's a whole other story still to be told about slavery. And mm. that's why I got out. Thank you, Thank you. Um, I'm obviously here to make up the numbers after listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're making uh, a real dance. I know. <laughs> I'm scared now. Um, I suppose, so my day job is working with young people. I work, uh, founded a, a black-led uh, organisation called Growing Futures, and we work with young people um, and their families affected by exclusion, serious youth violence, and child criminal exploitation. Um, and apart from that, I also work within the criminal justice system, um, I'm the chair of the Employment Advisory Board from HMP Bristol and also uh, independent chair of the Lambert Review Group uh, produced a report into disproportionality. 
Um, I think for me, the film was very traumatic. Um, uh, and that's the second time I've watched it. I think it, it was being with other people and watching it though too, um, was really, really quite powerful. Um, one of the things they said uh, it, it, in the, the production was that white people and black people will have to face the scars of slave trade moving forward. And I think that's possibly why I'm here because I, I do like history, but I'm going to leave it to people that know a bit more than me. But what's actually happening to our young people, not just black, but white people as well, there is a cognitive dissonance around colonialism and slavery. I think because it happened away from England. Um, if we talk about the Americas and what we're in October now, so I, 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 I really do like the fact we're talking about black history and, and black achievement, but um, it should be all the year round. But I think a lot of what happens is is that we talk about uh, American figures rather than our own figures. It's almost as, as if that we have this set narrative where we talk about Martin Luther King, um, you know, we, we talk about Frederick Douglass, but we don't talk about our own heroes that helped change the landscape. Uh, Colin Moody, um, he was around in the 19, uh, 19 after the Second World, uh, First World War. He opened the first children's clinic in London, but also fought against the colour bar uh, in this country. Um, and, and, and was really quite heavily involved in that. But we don't learn about that. And I do feel that there is this, with the rhetoric that we're getting, and this is my area now, from this new Tory government, where we had the CRED report that talks about slavery as a Caribbean experience that those involved should have taken up and, and prospered from. Um, and this, this reshaping of the narrative where we're not dealing with the issues that have come from slavery and colonialism um, are, are, are really a point where we can never actually solve the problem. Uh, I, I'm working on the race action plan with Avon and Somerset Police. I'm very disturbed at the fact that they can't admit to institutional racism. Uh, and for me, that will always maintain what's going on will never change because of that until we can actually get to, to, to grips with what's happened. Um, and there's good things that happened. There are allies that have been involved. You know, you talk about people who had sugar strikes. You know, these were white people who refused to take sugar because they understood the nature of slavery. Um, and, you know, there's a great book called Stay in Power, uh, written by Peter Fry, where he talks about the allyship. And we don't hear about the first trade unions in this country. People for who were enslaved people were brought here by trade unions to talk about how we could fight against landlords and, and this idea of, of, of this capitalist system. Um, so a lot of what we have in this country has been made because of slavery, but there's good things as well about how white English people stood up and, and fought back as well. And we don't hear enough about that. We have this idea of history that there were slaves and there were bad white people and everything got sorted out and here we are now and everything's great again. I think we've got to really, really analyze our history um, from the viewpoint of what does that make us and where are we going moving forward with that history? So that's the reason I think I'm here. Thank you, Chris. I just wanted to respond to that because another thought I had when I watched the play um, was we almost in this country, I think we need like a truth and reconciliation process. I think those words were, somebody said it in the play because what I know from obviously studying modern day South African history but also living in Germany um, and I went to live in Germany when I was 18 and people said, well, why would you go there? You're black, you know, they're really racist. But, you know, I, I'm open-minded and I want to learn about other cultures and experiences and I wanted to learn German um, to be different. And they definitely went for a reckoning um, as a country. So they denazified their minds as well as uh, what they went through. And I think in this country, we just haven't done that. You know, everybody's in denial. Everybody, that, you know, whatever you're back, even black people, you know, everybody's in complete denial. And you know now about citizens' assemblies, that's a thing that's taken off in different places. I, I, I really think that, um, yeah, that needs to be spearheaded. We, we need some sort of national truth and reconciliation um, process. Um, and I have to say, may she rest in peace, the Queen, etc. But to me, it's an opportunity now that we're having these conversations, that countries in the Commonwealth, four Caribbean countries already announced that they want to uh, become independent. They didn't even wait for the funeral, when, 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 you know, when they talked about that. It, uh, any, this is, uh, throughout my whole life, I don't remember these conversations. Um, and they've just, it's there. You know, I, th I think the ground has been laid, um, the England football team taking the knee, Harry Kane next to Raheem Sterling, etc. I think we've got to capitalise on it. 
um, and take this forward. And yeah, we need a national truth and reconciliation process. And there are other organisations I'm involved with. I won't say uh, which ones today, but if I am involved more deeply, say so you knows with that organisation, that's one of the things I think I would want to be leading. Thank you. I should say that this event is part of a series around the um, museum, which is looking at disrupting, I guess, heritage and storytelling. The three other events to come. Um, Angelique, you, you'll have to help me out with the dates in a minute. If, if you've got the programme to hand, or do you know them? 2nd of November. 2nd of November for digitisation and disruption. 22nd. 22nd of November for telling stories. And the 7th. And the 7th for December for references. <laughs> Thank you very much. So all of those events actually, thanks Angelique, actually completely fall out of this. Digitization and disruption. To some degree, the reason we're here this evening because of that, it's been digitized and it's actually disrupting the theater flow. Mm -hmm. You cut the chance to see it again. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of tied into that. Thanks to Sada's disruption, disruptive mm -hmm. tendencies. Mm -hmm. okay. Telling stories. You talked about narratives and how the narratives we tell ourselves. Um, truth from a constellation, I think, ties into that. Who are we as a base of who we think we are, what we know, what we don't know? Well, interesting you said about Kunle about the or the knowledge we don't have about that episode in history. And reparations, which Gendarme facilitated in December, and I think that truth and reconciliation is a really interesting tie into that. The idea of the, the major, when people talk about reparations, we all talk about money, we think of it as money, but actually acknowledgement, the recognition is a thing, um, which, is, which is, I think, also part of that. So this, this event sets these up as well, I think. I hope you can find out more about that and find out about them. Just want to ask one question, and then I want to open it up a little bit. So if you've got any questions and stuff, just show your hand or whatever, we'll just shout you out. Um, just ask, can I just ask my question first? Hold on to that, though, Benjamin, there. That's all right. Um, we're watching, it's still film theatre. We talked about film, but actually now we can call it film, but actually it's still theatre. Drama, dramatisation, it's quite documentary-like. Drum, dance, performance. I mean, what is the um, value in... Let's talk about theatre, because... It is film theatre, and it's not the same as taking a screen, a camera all around the world and putting it on the stage and doing close-ups and everything. It's a piece of theatre. So what's the value in these kind of entertaining forms, theatre, for telling serious storytelling and for prompting social change, do I think? What value does something like this serve? real change? Well, I'm part of a, a steering group in London at Southbank called African Odyssey, um, which... Um, uses film as a vehicle for opening up discussions on subjects that perhaps people either find difficult or inaccessible. Um, I like reading books, but not everybody likes reading books. Um, I like watching videos too. And I think that um, the way that technology has advanced has given us new insights and new openings in terms of how we can look at difficult material. Uh, and let's be you know, honest, the, the question of throwing 132 people into the sea in order to make an insurance claim is utterly, utterly barbaric. Right? And it begs the question, what happens at that time? And to my mind, I suppose one of the other things that we need to also understand is social context. So apart from slavery, we have the issue of the Napoleonic Wars. We have the issue of um, the question of the economy and what value you place on human life. And so, you know, Marx talks about uh, labor as a commodity. <laughs> In slavery, it is completely <laughs> commodity driven to the point where life becomes worthless uh, unless it's valued in exchange of relations. So, for me, it's really important that we also understand those other driving things that are going on and, uh, in terms of what's shaping society at this particular point in time. So I think film is a, is a way of introducing those more complex ideas. Yeah, I um, completely agree. I mean, I think also, you know, just taken up to now, if you look about what's happening in the city of London now with people short in the pounds, um, you can see that that's quite... Um, brutal as well because we know what the outcome of that is probably going to be for people in this country. So, you know, the markets that, that you were just talking about have a history of brutality um, um, and, and which we call our capitalist system. 
Um, um, so I think, again, that's something we have to look at. But again, you know, for me, um, it's a representation as well, but not just representations on screen. It's about people being able to play with their own history. Um, for a long time, I haven't really, you know, maybe it's my, my failure, but I haven't been around this kind of theatre where you've got people who are imagining part of their history and putting it in a different way. And, and it is really about our culture. And I do think in this country, there is a lot of culture, but I think from, from, from people of African heritage, it's always on the sidelines. Um, and, and for me to see this here in the old Vic on a screen with, with a good bunch of people is, is what I want to see more. And it's, it's that artistic um, a bit as well, rather than just seeing representation. It's really about that art being allowed to flourish in, in our culture. Thank you. Mm. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, um, I'm also on the board of the Bernie Grant Art Centre um, in London, and that was um, built David Ajay, wonderful guy named British architect, um, in around 2007. Um, Bernie was political, as you know, but they decided it should be an art centre that should um, remember him because what they understood is that you can tell stories, as we've seen tonight, the, the power of the art to capture people's imaginations can change the world. And we've seen it in this country. I don't know how many of you have heard of a film called Cappy Come Home. Um, that was directed by Ken Loach back in, I think, was it the late the 60s? Um, and that was the first time that there was a representation of homelessness, um, a, a, a young mother um, on the streets. And apparently that was what led to the creation of Shelter, the charity, and homelessness law. So these films, um, the arts, can change the world. People think it's woolly, absolutely not. More screenings like this, um, the Bernie Grant Art Centre, we've applied for um, something called NPO status, National, um, what is it? Right, and there are no black-led uh, organisations who have yet achieved that status. We're crossing our fingers we get that, because if we do get that, that puts us on the same level um, as the National the Theatre, Bristol the Bristol Old Vic, you know, it would be really, really important to keep giving an airing um, and amplifying uh, plays like this and others that wouldn't normally get um, um, you know, any exposure. So again, I have that hat on too because I think that the arts film is also activism. I saw The Woman King on Saturday. Yes. You know, I don't know if you've seen it. <laughs> seen that already, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you can see, if you see that and then you see this, you start to feel like bionic woman. Um, you know, and change the world. So the, the arts film is everything um, in terms of us changing the world. That's how I see it. That's beautiful, thank you. Mm. Benjamin. <coughs> is it Benjamin? Yes, yes. Uh, what's your question? You can shout it out. So um, um, I'm coming from the Blue Bear Summit that's happening in Bristol. And people are talking a lot about ecology and climate change. And um, they don't seem to realise that there's an interrelation between of colonial heritage, the lack of acknowledgement of it, the systems of domination and exploitation that are in place at the moment, and the sustainability crisis that we're facing. How can you help all these people to realize that acknowledging the colonial and slave uh, heritage is not just about uh, looking at history, it's about overcoming the great challenges of all times and building the direct world future. Can I say merci beaucoup? Mm -hmm. Would that, right, would that right, right. right assumption? Thank you. Yeah, I, I was going to say one of the advantages we have in this generation is how interconnected we are to know what other people in other countries are talking about. And I feel privileged that we live at a time when um, Mia Motley is the Prime Minister of Barbados. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that she's gone to the UN and she said, you know, we cannot survive, the Caribbean countries cannot survive if the temperature rises more than 1.5 degrees. And that's gone viral around the world. To connect us here in the UK back to those countries who will face extinction. So that is on the radar. And as I said before, the fact the Law Society, this really sort of crusty institution <laughs> is now talking about giving legal rights to animals, trees and rivers. Keep pushing. Keep pushing because, because it's here. Um, another thing I'm involved in is a group of lawyers who want to be involved in the climate justice fight. 
first meeting on Zoom this Thursday, um, and it was black activists who sent me that link and said, sign up to it to connect the dots. So, so this is happening. You know, people are starting to talk in the interconnectedness of the world. Social media is bad, but it's also good. It's the beginning. Keep, keep the pressure on. Yeah, I think for me, the, the issues around the environment and the mass of people in society is really the, it exemplifies a failure to address the issue of class, actually, and the engagement of working class people in uh, these discussions. Uh, in terms of where it uh, ends up, um, I don't know, but it, it's, uh, it, it, it needs something that builds um, a partnership and engagement. And unless you have that, what you have is antagonism and uh, also confusion around tactics in terms of how you lobby, um, uh, how you demonstrate, uh, and indeed, when you take direct action, who is the action directed at? So, in terms of you know what I feel needs to be built, it's not just um, about talking about these things, but uh, our process of education and creating that solidarity. You cannot create solidarity in the abstract. Uh, and in terms of you know the abolitionists that we've seen today, it's really interesting. I come from a place in South London uh, where which was home to the Clapham sect. The Clapham sect was led by Granville Sharp, uh, Wilberforce, Thomas Clarkson, Equiano. Uh, the church where they used to gather on Clapham Common is still there. And in fact, there's a plaque on the side of the church. But um, as I said before, we need to also understand context. The Chartist movement, which doesn't feature in the play, was also instrumental in the anti-slavery movement. Mm -hmm. And the push for the right to vote, for universal suffrage, mm -hmm. was happening at the same time as abolition. And in fact, many of the leading abolitionists were also interested in the Chartist. Robert Wedderburn, the illegitimate son of Lord Wedderburn, who came from Jamaica to see his family in Scotland in the freezing cold, having traveled all that distance, was shown the door. It wasn't until 2007 that the Wedderburn family in Scotland acknowledged Robert Wedderburn, one of the most important political figures in British history, mixed race, as the one of their own. So, you know, that's what I'm saying about, the, in terms of solidarity, it's not just about uh, the anti-slavery movement and the charters, they were together. It's not just about the environment, and it's not just about, you know, struggles around uh, heating, bills, or, you know, the, the cost of living. All of those things have to come into the mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing I can add is, is that this isn't new news to people in so-called developing countries. You know, before we had Greta, there was quite a few African and Asian young people who were shouting about climate emergency, um, and probably for the last 20 years. Unfortunately, until Europe gets its feet wet, is the only time that they started to actually take it seriously. When you're talking about Madagascar and other places, we're talking about Pakistan at the moment, that does little to add to our, our, our CO2 emissions, underwater, Bangladesh every year, you know, flooded. Um, you know, this has been going on for ages, but it's only until we start seeing it in Europe that we suddenly feel that there's an issue. And I think that really talks to the point that, yes, people are on, on it now, but what has taken them to get there it hasn't been the goodwill and, and suddenly we've had a rev revelation that actually colonialism was bad, you've got to change. It's only when it affects us. Mm -hmm. If you look at what's happening to African countries, especially in France, where they, they're sapping out all the, all, all the minerals and, and, and all the, the goods from there and charging those countries to ship them out as well. You know, what you've got in, 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 in Haiti with them still having to keep paying back the, the, the revolutionary money, you know, the, this is the world we live in now, and these decisions being made by our leaders now. Um, so, so I do think that, going back to the climate, it's really important that we understand that we're not living in a world where everyone wants the good for everyone else. There is still vested interest in keeping Europe as the pivotal point of the world to absorb all those minerals and be 
the First Nation? Mm. Well, I mean, I would argue it's not just Europe anymore, is it? <laughs> and, and also, um, do we have any real power? Because, you know, when the market sneezes, we all start to shiver and all that. So we can say, let's, let's elect a revolutionary leader who will respond to genuine public concern and <coughs> ideas around issue A or issue X. But then lies come out in the press, whoever controls that. Markets start to do this and do that, like say shorting pounds and all the rest of it. What power do we really have? What power do we really have? You talk about laws, laws to change or, 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 uh, or what laws we want to see or laws we have. I mean, do we have any real power to change these things? Um, I'm an internationalist, so I just don't think we should be thinking of this in just a UK context. We won't win if you just think in a UK context. We've got to be joined up to campaigns and struggles internationally. That's what will work. As I said, the fact that you can now watch live in real time, me and Motley speaking to the UN on YouTube, or uh, back in the spring, I was sent to the United States to meet civil rights activists out there, met with Jesse Jackson's people, the Reverend Al Sharpton, um, the lawyers um, to the family of George Floyd. And what they are all doing now is developing international coalitions for us to fight these struggles together, because we haven't. I also went to Congress um, to meet with members of the Congressional Black Caucus. They said, it's time for us to get involved, um, because they haven't. They've just seen themselves as American. Whereas we said, look, we're, we're drowning over here. The Irish, you know, Americans in Congress will tell the government in the UK, no, do not mess about with the Good Friday Agreement, and they back off. We said, you, Congress people in America, you're still powerful black Americans. You need to start coming to the aid of black Britons in the UK, in um, Kenya, etc. And they're up for it. So, so there, there is something going on. Uh, this interconnectedness is what is going to lead to progress. I, I'm hopeful about that. The George Floyd family lawyers now are developing, um, I don't want to call them projects, it, it's, it's too big for that, but stuff with the UN, um, frameworks we've never had. Um, before. That would never have happened even five years ago. Um, and UK activists are linking with African activists and American activists and allies around the world. Um, so I am hopeful, I'm an optimist and I'm, I'm hopeful because I'm seeing it, I'm part of it. Um, I'm living it at the moment and, the, and there's more to come involving all of you and anybody who wants to be involved. Thank you. Kunda, how can we see that interconnectedness beyond ethnicity lines? Because you talked about the Chartist movement, etc. And narratives we tell ourselves, people often defend all lives matter, white lives matter, on the basis of who they think they are, and think that black lives matter is a divisive idea. How do we keep change the narrative on that divisiveness? How do we claim, say, how can we say black lives matter and still understand at the heart that really does mean all lives matter without people getting defensive? Well, I, I think I've always believed that, uh, for example, you can, you, can, you can understand the universal by looking at the particular. Um, by that I mean looking at the individual experience and through that, you can understand a more general understanding of how people connect. But I, I mean, I'm not uh, as optimistic maybe as some of the other speakers. I think we have a problem in this country, particularly in relation to America, in that we have a very specific historical development, which we do not know enough about. So when we're looking at things like George Floyd, we forget you know, about people like Clinton McCurbin in Wolverhampton, 1987, was killed in a, a neck shot by two security officers and a police officer, asphyxiation. Joy Gardner, who was killed in Tottenham, 1993, uh, by immigration officers, again, asphyxiated. Mm -hmm. Now, I know this history because I'm of a certain age. I lived through it. Yeah. You know, I was outside Tot Tottenham Police Station with a loud hailer. Uh, I went to uh, Wolverhampton on those demonstrations. So when I saw George Floyd, to me it didn't strike me as something profound yeah. because we'd already had yeah. episodes of that in Britain. Mm -hmm. And people have not really joined up the dots mm -hmm. in, in that respect. So for me, uh, the real question is getting a better understanding of how we uh, respond when such things happen in our own communities, what happens nationally? Why is it that the glamour, and I'm, I'm using this in a very provocative sense, the glamour of American violence is what draws us in. And yet, 
we're not interested in what happens in our own country. Uh, you know, up in Leeds, um, you know, you have David Ola Wale, uh, local people in Leeds. 1967 was chased into the river yeah. by two police officers who systematically over two months brutalized him. Mm -hmm. you know, he was sleeping in a doorway, mind his own business, mm -hmm. at night they'd go and piss on him yeah. while he was sleeping there. He was killed by those two police officers. There's a campaign in Leeds to actually get a statue to David Oluwole. Yeah. <laughs> so how come that isn't on the nine o'clock news? Mm -hmm. So for me, there's a problem. Uh, you know, obviously what happened to George Floyd was horrific, but we need to you know, start looking at what's happening at home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to ask this, any more questions to queue for? One, any more? Just check one second, sorry. Two, three, okay. Uh, did you want to respond to that directly or do you rather hear the questions, Des? I, I think I'm happy with it, everyone answering the response. Let's get the question. I just, um, you're talking about like uh, death from police officers in history. Like, um, just, I think it was, it was probably within like a couple of months of George Floyd, there was a guy. I'm really sorry, but I don't remember his name. I know it's Hodge Jones and Allen that took on the case, um, who was pinned to the ground and died. Ian Chaper. Yeah, yeah. I remember his face. I yeah. don't remember his name. Yeah. Um, and then Chris Cover, which is still, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is like this year. Yeah. Say of history, it's, it's right now as well. Yeah. It wasn't really a question, it was just. Um, have, you, have you heard of Joy Gardner before? Yeah. Yeah. You look kid, you're a lawyer student. You're no, I'm, I'm an engineer okay. activist, but I really want to go into the law. So, uh, I'm very far away from it right now. <laughs> okay, so these are obviously systemic issues, Des. And you're Definitely, working yeah. with the police, the Lamy Review. Any, any impact looking to be made there? Yeah, I mean, you know, so I had a report come out in March around disproportionality of the criminal justice system. Um, to be honest, uh, again, you know, since David Lammy's report, and that's what we proactively built on, you know, I'm, I'm still horrified at the fact that we don't, aren't collecting the right kind of data um, uh, around the criminal justice system. I'm absolutely shocked. I thought I'd be coming in actually to deal with the data, but we are still in 2022, still struggling to get agencies to actually look at ethnicity around criminal justice. Um, Can I ask but, you a question? Hmm. Is anyone looking at school exclusions? Yeah, looking at school exclusions. The school to prison pipeline is one of the areas um, that, that we need to deal with. I had a meeting yesterday with the magistrates. Again, not under, they don't understand the data they've got um, in the children's courts. A youth offending team, some of their data is, is, is missing and any things they've done around to, to change that, they're not evaluating or monitoring. So it's a very haphazard uh, way. Um, and as I said, I'm, I was quite disturbed after David Lammy. Just following on um, from that point though, but I'm working with young people who understand American law um, and don't understand how to, how to survive a stop and search. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, and it's not being taught in their schools. If we look at stop and search in Bristol, in the Naval and Somerset, 53% uh, of, uh, of all stop and searches are drug related. Out of those stops and searches, 60% of black people have been stopped with no further action. Um, and some of the disengagement from those stop and searches are absolutely horrendous, but also you know, we were promised by Theresa May that we would have um, intelligence-led policing around stop and search in 2015. Most of the stop and searches of, of black men, and I say black men majoritively, are, are basically based on profile of, of you're in a high crime area, uh, a suspect looking like you. These things are still happening. And I remember, I'm old enough to remember Suslaw, um, and the way we're now going with Section 60s now, suspicionless stops and searches with left caveats on how are you, how are you, is used means we are slipping back into that, that realm. And actually what's happening is, unfortunately, black people are still disproportionately affected by use of force, deaths in custody. I mean, the figures are truly horrendous for 2022. Um, and so, you know, we're still in the fight um, and, and we need to keep, keep going. But, you know, um, I, I do find that there's a lot of kind of lip service. You know, David Lammy said, I think in his 2020 update, he said action shouldn't be confused with tangible outcomes. And at the moment, we are in the action stage where there's a lots of things going on, but actually, are we getting to the point where we're actually achieving anything on the ground? I speak to parents every day after Antoine Forrester. I don't know if anyone remembers him. He's the paddle boy, the woman struck him in the head with the paddle. 
I've been involved in that family. Since that, I've had phone calls from dozens of families who feel that they're underprotected by the police, mm -hmm. that, they, that they're being over-policed. Um, and, and these are calls I'm getting every single day where I can phone a senior officer and suddenly it's been investigated. Yeah. Um, but before that, they're not getting anything. And just one just anecdote, I had a young boy, 12, who was punched in the face by a grown man. His eye sock, um, socket was fractured. Um, and it took me phoning the police four or five times. It took them three months to go and visit him and take a statement. But that was the pressure that I could push and other people could put. But they weren't doing it by themselves. Now these are, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to... Sorry, that's yeah. Aiden the Somerset. Aiden the Somerset, yeah. And that's still going forward now. But that took, again, the family to do the investigation, to get the phone records from Snapchat and all their friends to actually prove a case now where they can go forward. Um, so these are issues. And there's good stuff happening with the police. You know, they are on the move, but it's not happening fast enough on the ground. So people are getting fed up. They are at the end of their tether around policing and criminal justice. Um, yeah, okay, I could go on. Thank you. Mm. There's a comment or question at the back. Sorry, I don't need a mic. Like, no, please use it. <laughs> it's Admiral. I'd like, you, I'd like to get your voice recorded, if oh, I okay. <laughs> Thank you, Admiral. Is that Admiral? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes it's Admiral. Good. That um, sounds nice. I've listened to what all of you have said. And for me, I would like to know what is the um, master plan? <laughs> what is the master plan with everything that all of you have said and everything that all of us know and have as our own experience? How is that going to be brought together for us to have a plan. When it comes, to, that's the first question. When it comes to not a small the question. Question. <laughs> when it comes to the USA, my opinion has always been that we are buddies with the USA, and that buddiness, that closeness, has cost us and has cost us big. Some of the examples that you were just giving, whereby our youth think more of what's going on in the USA. They know more about the stop and search, etc., that goes on in the USA. That's because we are so closely linked in government, our prime ministers. You always see them doing something together that's dangerous. And for me, that is where it starts. Because we always see that on television. So it's assumed that what's going on in America is far more important than what's going on in our own country. We have lots of examples of what brutality, I'm going to call it, goes on in our own country. How are we going to make sure that that is the profile every single time that we are learning about and that we are talking about. And that is where we have the power to change that narrative. How are we going to do it? Okay, thank you, Rose. Well, I'm going to simply shrug that down to really two comments, but you, you've got a question, you've got a comment as well, have you? I just want to throw them all up in the air for the minute, and then you can, because we're almost finished, really, out of time, to be very So. Um, what's the master plan, which might actually have to be the last question we come back to? How do we de depend less on our narratives of how we live on the US? Uh, I'm going to answer that one uh, as a creative black artist who has worked with uh, the National Theatre in London. and Wh Which been, one are you answering? Uh, the last The US one. one. Yeah, the US one. Uh, in the Somali realm of... Uh, unifying against uh, the black rights movement and the BLM movement in America, especially in Manapolis as a Somali person, I have been told through my large connection of networks as Somali artists, storytellers, theater productionists, and people who tell children's stories, yes, children's stories, about what Stop and Search is. And I have been very privileged to learn from my investigative journalist of a dad who has known these skills of 
how to defer the police, uh, wh why you dressing differently could be a aspect of you being stopped and searched, which happened to me four weeks ago, and I had a photo of with the police. <laughs> it's a completely <laughs> different narrative. We just have to know how we tell our narratives of the spaces we hold. If I am in my Somali gown, in my Somali food, in my long bed sheets and my staff, <laughs> going away with my artistic expression of my don't pollute the fish, okay. it's like an it's artistic artist. expression. It's having that knowledge, but not the knowledge, but also the story to say, I am this person, this is my name. Firstly, they have to say their name. Police is going to always ask that, what's your name, what do you do? When you come, when you give all that, when you just keep telling the story, you're not. Okay, can I, can I stop you there? Thank you. So, I'm hearing that narrative is important. Your own narrative. Your own narrative is important, which sounds like the basis of a stop and search workshop in terms of how you approach it, but narrative is the key thing idea there. So we've still got those two questions hanging. We have I've to got two short answers to Short questions. answers, short yeah. answers coming. There wasn't a, that was a statement though, wasn't it? Yeah. What, Short response. What I'm going to do, that master plan question, that's the, everything in the universe, but what I'm going to do to answer those two questions is just give the name names of two organisations where you can make a start. So for the first one, what do we do, how do we bring it together? The reason I met Sardo is because um, I was the acting chief executive of a new national civil rights organisation called Black Equity Organisation. It was formed on May 24th this year to dismantle systemic racism when you, in the UK. When you tell people that, I say, what on earth? That's huge. But your question was huge, that's the response. Check it out, Black Equity Organisation, that is what it is supposed to be doing. Um, because the founders, David Lamy included, Kwame Kweyama, um, director, David Olive Shoga, um, uh, some lawyers, community activists, they got together and just said, enough. Okay, so if you check out Black Equity Organisation, that's the beginning of an answer to the master plan to dismantle systemic racism. The second organization, in terms of the second question, um, I would check out the Lenny Henry Center for Media Diversity. So Lenny Henry got together with a guy called Marcus Ryder, who um, used to be the head of BBC Scotland, he's mixed race, Jamaican, British, and they are really making a lot of noise and telling the BBC and Channel 4 and the other mainstream media outlets, the way you tell stories, if you do not involve diverse voices, things will not change. So what you talked about narratives, they are doing sterling work, they're based at the University of Birmingham. Check out those two organisations, Black Equity Organisation and the Lenny Henry Centre for Media Diversity. And I hope you'll start to find some answers in those organisations because people are thinking exactly what you are. And, and some people have decided to do something about it. Any thoughts on the US question? Um, yes, you know, the work Marcus said, you know, when the Queen died, he said, look, you've not managed to get diverse voices from around the country to explain the British experience. That, that is what they're doing, trying to amplify those voices. Um, UK voices. So we don't have to keep telling our story through the lens of the US. That, that's what I'm saying, go and have a look, because it's distinctly British in terms of saying we need to address our history through our own narrative. Thank you. Des? Just, just really quickly, I think for answers to both those questions, I mean, is very localised. For me, it's the biggest protective um, factor we've got for our children is our schools. That's where, that's where we need to start, and I think we need to lobby schools. Schools are really afraid at the moment. I mean, when I, I'm 53 this year. When I was growing up, school was centre of my community. It was where we had barn dances, um, fates, you know, and, and as, as not very wealthy um, family, we relied on the church and, and schools. What we have now is schools rushing at three o'clock to lock the gates behind the kids so they don't have to deal with them anymore, but also not dealing with the trauma that their parents have, possibly through their own um, um, schooling. But you have things like secret BIP panels, where, where exclusion panels, where parents can't even be involved in the schooling of their children. So I think it is, and I might get a kickback, but I think we need to go back into our schools and, 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 and re reevaluate what we're doing for our children. I think that will be the start of the first part of your question, but also it will centre our knowledge on what's happening in our area rather than all our, all our, our, our media coming from YouTube and American channels. Um, you know, I, I've got grandkids and they're all talking like Anna and Hey and Frozen and, 
And, and it, it, you can see it happening in front of your eyes because they are talking with American accents when they're playing. Play. Thank you. So it actually goes back to the beginning of your point as well, doesn't it, about storytelling. We had, um, I thought you were next. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to, thanks. Um, yeah, so kind of leading on your point in school, actually, um, I think my main question is, um, I think there's some issues that are quite salient in the black community in terms of racial justice, which is um, slavery, um, police brutality, and diversity in the media, <laughs> um, and some other issues too. And I'm a student in the University of Bristol studying global development and environment, so getting people to care about environmental issues is an issue. Um, but I think school is like one of the central areas where a lot of injustice is normalized um, towards yeah. kids. Um, I recently just watched um, Small Acts Education and the subsequent documentary as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I think that's a very important diversity issue in media, like what stories are we telling? not just black people we included in different things, but also telling important stories. Um, but when I was watching it, I didn't, I felt like, yeah, some things have changed for sure, but there's a way that school is arranged that feels the same. Because um, I went to a school where a lot of the young black and brown kids were in bottom set and, um, uh, a lot. I think there is negligence there towards the school, uh, children in terms of education and a writing of, which is essentially people with our units instead of um, special needs, um, not special needs schools, but education at least a normal. You have the school exclusion to, um, to school to prison pipeline. Um, yeah, those things like how like I don't think there's a conversation on like not just get rid of these schools, but how we do education as well that doesn't marginalise kids <laughs> in a way that, you know, I feel like telling a kid that they're a set eight is a bit much. <laughs> I'm being honest with you. And we sorry, don't realize tell a kid that they're what, sorry? Sorry? Tell a ten year old that they're in set eight when they're that, That's a bit much. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, nobody, and I don't think there's an urgency at all to, like, think about, in fact, I think there's more ramping up of policies that are going to, like, marginalise these kids more. And, yeah, I think there's an issue with schooling. <laughs> and that's, like, it's normalised violence, essentially. And how can we attack all the violences when we're not focusing on some of the things that are just, like, really everyday experience? Like, I think we need to expand our mind, uh, expand the issues we talk about, our activism and everything. So I think my question is um, ways to approach that, I guess. <laughs> can I just... You got a direct response to that? Yeah, yeah. Direct response to that? And then you're bursting over there. I know you, you two have got questions here as well, but let's keep it quick if we can, because yeah, we're so, almost out of time. So the issue around, around schooling, you're right. I mean, the, the, the young, uh, young People's Commissioner came out with a report about exclusions mm -hmm. and amplification. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as part of my report, we've set, well, we've set up an exclusion task force. Well, not me, but it, it was set up around some of my recommendations. And I've sat in that meeting and I've really tried to talk about adaptation and there's tumbleweed. No one wants to talk about it. About what, sorry? Adaptation. Adult education. Yeah. I'm probably not saying it right. Could you explain what that is? It's basically seeing our black young people as older, bigger, and usually darker. And than the consequence? They actually are. And Treating the consequence? them like they're and more dangerous. Yeah. And the consequence? Oh, the consequence, well, in schools that they're, you know, schools use behaviour policies which uh, have been proven to affect black children much more than white children. So. What happens is, is that they were seen as more violent, more aggressive, and even that what they've done, if, if a white peer does the same thing, it's not seen. There was a, just really quickly, there was a, a piece done by Harvard where they got, I think it was uh, a thousand teachers to watch a, a, a group of preschoolers, and there was a black kid sitting in there, and basically what they were told was to look out for bad behavior. Now, none of the children did anything bad, but they trapped the teacher's eyes, and these were black teachers too. They all constantly were looking at the black child yeah, to see yeah. whether that child was going to do anything. And I think that has been done in Bristol, I think, before, I um, can't remember his name now, but he, 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 anyway, I can't remember it. But yeah, it, it's been done here, and the same thing happened where, you know, and we've seen it in our, in our, in our behaviour policies that people will get pulled out. The question, what's the approach to that? What are we going to do about it? Which ties to the master plan? 
Well, we, we need to get into the schools and take, take back ownership of it. I mean, I think we're working with uh, BSW and around uh, public sector uh, equality duty and um, EIAs, which is ethnic impact assessments, to look at the behaviour po policy so that we can actually start levelling the ground around some of this stuff. So I think there is work, and, 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 and I'm sure Sado and, and the team would, if people are interested in getting involved with, with things like that, to get involved because it's, it's people power that's going to win it. And, you know, we can't keep looking for someone else to do it because if not us, then who? Thank you. Let's Can I go. also add that everybody in this room, if you're not a school governor, you should become one. Um, school governors have so, I was also a school governor. Um, they have a lot of power, a lot of power. You know, get involved. It's serving your community, it's being involved. You don't have to be a parent. Just find out about it. Primary schools, secondary schools, just get involved. Come and activist, yeah. yeah. And, and can I add to that? You've had your hand up for ages. What's your point up there? Who's that? Is that Arthur? As, um, as someone who has uh, just finished from GCSEs, I've gone through the process uh, and I can attest to the fact that there is a total inadequacy in my school and certainly other schools in education around like what we have been talking about tonight. There is no, as far as I'm aware, there is no national like kind of almost curriculum, um, us uh, trying to educate us on this. And what we do get is all the schools saying we have a zero tolerance uh, yeah. zero to uh, yeah. tolerance yeah. policy uh, on discrimination, and we uh, do not accept it. Racism is bad. Sexism is bad. Don't do it. That is the extent <laughs> to which but yeah. we are. Educated. But you, you're a different generation, right, Arthur? So Fantastic when generation. You, when you hear, I mean, I can't get over the fact that probably there were more white people on Black Lives Matter marches around the world than anything, for a start. When you hear all this stuff, we're going back to the 80s, the 70s, and the rest of it, what sense does it make to you as a young person, racialized as white, but in a generation where you've mixed, you're a much more diverse generation than your grandparents ever a part of? What does all this mean to you? Does it sound like a surprise that we're talking about all this stuff? Absolutely. A lot of the things that we uh, have talked about this tonight is new to me and is something that I was not aware of before I came here. It's almost taken for granted that a lot of us are educated in this, I feel. Um, and I, I don't really know how to deal with it almost. Like, at a certain point watching the thing, I almost felt, wait, where do I sit in this? Should I feel uh, guilt about what my ancestors have done, I don't know where my place is and, and how should I should act. And I feel like as, as someone who has been educated to a certain extent, <laughs> there's going to be lots of people around the country who also feel like that and will also be lost in this Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, that, that's why I'm suggesting something like a Truth and Reconciliation process where we process all of this collectively, nationally, everybody, whatever their background, ethnic background, socioeconomic background, we need to do it all together so we can all make sense of it um, together. Um, that, that would be, that's why I suggested that earlier, really, because you say you don't know very much, neither do I, and I'm, you know, yeah. three times older than you, and I'm only just learning this stuff mm. now. Um, you know, it's a shock to me as well. Um, so it's, it's not just the 16-year-olds, it's people a lot older who are coming to this fresh as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks for all the comments and stuff. Everyone. It's been really enlightening, actually, all of them. Um, and it's a shame Kunle isn't here because he might be able to help answer this question. I was just thinking, do you think there might actually be a general artistic and narrative gap here? And I really dislike this term because I know where it comes from. Um, about the actual history of white people in this country and their experience of racist behaviour as perpetrators. 
yep. to actually start talking about it in terms of the colonial history of the UK, from when it was first colonised by the Normans, and how that created the class system, when the people of the UK were enslaved by them, and how that it resulted in... Because this um, film touched on it a little bit about the, what it actually did to the... Talking less about sort of the moral dimension of enslavement to people is bad. Yeah, everyone's known this for thousands of years. It's not a new thing. Mm. There's always been a resistance against enslaving people. Like it. it's, when people sort of say, oh, there was a different time, it's rubbish. People were resisting it then, always. But do you think there's a narrative conversation that isn't happening? Do you think there is? I think there is. But I see that there's a gap, and I'm just wondering if it's something you think that is it. How would that be approached to actually make sure that conversation happens? Where, where do you say, think the big gap is, as it were? Because we hear about Wilberforce, we hear about resistance, we hear about Sharp. Yeah. That, but where do you think the gap is? Because, and, and how do we stop poor Arthur and the generation feeling guilty? Mm. Because enslaving people has always been about money. That's why the Zone case worked because it came about money. It wasn't a moral yeah. argument, it, was it wasn't a moral argument, argument, wasn't it? The money argument won. And it's always won in the UK. The um, slavery was banned by the UK as a state to stop the French making money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> because it was stopping the competition with the UK and the French Revolution uh, after the Poems Earth. So I the lack of sort of stopping the guilt by people in the education system. No, stand up, talk about your own history. Talk about who you actually are, and that this, the ideas of colonialism and empire, particularly in the UK, which is in existence, need to be talked about by white people, and how it makes them feel, how it makes them feel superior, and the idea of better than corrupts people morally. It makes them do very bad. Absolutely. I mean, you're absolutely right. Narrative gap. I think you're absolutely right. So, can we? We've got lots going on over here. There was a. Sade had a point. There was someone up behind you, and then Kian burst in. You lost your thought. You were, up, you were next, I think, up there. I can't see you are. Well. Mm. Um, one of my favourite scenes in, in the play was a kind of satire on, on ideology. Um, you can see how the UK and England is very focused on the monarchy, uh, very focused on war, uh, very focused on money, which was discussed over there. Uh, so so has, our, has, has this country's ideology really changed from the 1800s to now? Uh, Do you, have they changed? No. Okay. Crazy discovered they haven't changed, I think. Yes, danger. But also Jeremy. Anyway, that's another story. Um, just because the mic is next to you, Barbara, can you um, make, say something? Yeah. Good evening. I just just want to make a few observations. Like, not that in the, the piece we watched was amazing and it's intensity. But there's, for instance, not even a mention of all the hundreds of rebellions that happened by... Uh, people who were enslaved and trafficked or from the beginning up until the abolitionists got, got involved in the process. There's always been rebellions happening in Africa, Caribbean, America from the onset. One. Two, as a storyteller, I always believe that the narrative should be balanced. Yeah. Uh, what we all get taught and we all to a degree, uncover is the horrors and the trauma and the suffering that our ancestors experience. Yes, that needs to be addressed, that's true, but during the same period, and I'm not talking about ancient Africa, I'm talking about that exact crude, gruesome period, our ancestors, whilst being in that state where they attempted to reduce them to subhuman level, they created every innovation that we are using today in our daily lives. Everything. Why? Because they had to find a way to improve and keep the work off their backs and kind of create a bit of a situation where as the 
masters and their overseers, they have no need to think outside of their little plantation box. So this is something that we need to acknowledge alongside the trauma that everything we're using in our houses. Oh, can I come out? Are you South African? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so and I would say, uh, you mentioned the TRC. Yes, yeah, right. so talk about your experience. Yes, that. thank you. And that's not an example we much in South Africa. Most of the people's stories who have suffered, who have legitimate uh, 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 needs to express, was never heard. Okay, so that's the issue. Main. There was mm -hmm. a selected few people's yeah. stories. Yeah. And I'm, I'm saying this from a broken heart. Yeah, I'm yeah. not talking yeah. because I want to be smart. Yeah. The TRC was one of those big problems. Yeah. Because if you look at the South African situation now, it's as bad, yeah. if not worse, as it was during all of colonialism yeah. and all of apartheid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they make a human right law that mm -hmm. addresses, addresses the, the imbalance that occurred. Yeah. But that same law has a, a, a sunset clause. Yeah. It literally undermines it. Okay. Yeah. So it's interesting to learn because you also learn what you don't do. So, yeah, for me that's quite interesting. And maybe if the intention of the state-led thing was to just put a lid on it, as opposed to actually feel the truth, maybe it would have taken a lot long different mm -hmm. process. Yeah. But maybe the intention actually yeah. might be captured, if not the state yeah. is And I'm not necessarily saying it should be the state that runs it. You know, I'm saying there should be citizens' assemblies and we can do this ourselves, to be yes. honest. There yeah. are ways, there are good examples in the world of how Definitely. we potentially could find Definitely. collective solutions. Yeah. There's not going to be one master plan. No. It's not going to be up to one particular group of people in our society. We have to find the courage to encourage the dialogue from our children. Yeah. Actually start teaching our children what's really going on instead of just teaching them about fairy tales. Fairy tales are cool, but we have to give them more than that. Yeah. To let them Can I make another point about, about people who um, say, oh, it's nothing to do with us, you know, we weren't there. Gary Young, wonderful journalist who you'll all have heard of, he says, well, it's really interesting that um, many English people will say, we won the war. Okay, and they'll say, we won the World Cup. And he said, well, you weren't there during the War of the World Cup, so why we, but when it's slavery, no, it's nothing to do with us. So if anybody says that to you, you say, well, no, 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 no. You know, if you can claim the good, you should also claim the not so good as well. You know, you've got to be balanced about it. And I, the way he articulated that, I think, makes a lot of sense. Brilliant. Now, we have to stop. The good thing about it is this, that um, it was a beautiful discussion, and thank you for your questions. Really sorry for all those who couldn't get questions in. Sorry there's no master plan, I've really just been told. There is Black Equity Organisation. Oh, is there is a master plan, plan Lillian. Have a look. Well, say it again, sorry. You said you'd like to see something come out yeah, of it. Yeah, I would like that with a step, and out of that, then some kind of initiative emerges where young people are getting together to voice their views and maybe find a way forward that works for them from their perspective. And then also, obviously, adults who are within that circuit and also the local community. Because I think it's great for us to sit and talk and explore and share ideas. But how do you make it dynamic without necessarily institutionalizing it so you create something different that is dynamic, that is living, and that is um, influenced by the direct living experience of people in the UK today who are black and white and who want to see something different, and that is going beyond the impact statements of, mm. which are only ever managed institutionally and actually don't realise any genuine <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's yeah. Thank, you Thank you very much. Uh, I was going to get you to do a new positive prayer, actually, rather than and I was going to try that, but that might not work. Yeah. I'd like to thank... Uh, it's all about young people. All about the young people. Yeah, it is. No, it is. Well, this is true. But also, 
to be fair, it's not just he's gone now, but it's not just out to him to be feeling guilty and not yeah. him to feeling guilty and confused. How do we lead them? Anyway, that's not Miranda, it's been absolutely wonderful Thanks. having you. Des, thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much for your yeah. Also, I'd like to thank the old Vic, Josh, Dan, Team Imogen, Lucy, and Team Imogen. Yeah. 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 Yeah.